A couple months back, Errol Spence accused Anthony Joshua of having a glass jaw. And in this article right here, Andy Ruiz is also bringing AJ's punch resistance into question, especially in light of AJ's apparent weight loss. Ruiz suggesting that AJ being lighter could actually make his punch resistance even worse. Well, how do you define glass jaw? I think people have got different definitions, to be fair. What we know about Anthony Joshua, though, is he was hurt against Dylan White. He was dropped by Vladimir Klitschko. He was hurt in the first round against Povetkin. And he was hurt and dropped multiple times and stopped, ultimately, by Andy Ruiz in their first fight. So, at the very least, we have to all agree that Anthony Joshua doesn't have a good chin. Nobody could ever accuse him of having an iron jaw, okay? But how bad is his punch resistance? It is an important question going into the Ruiz rematch. Now, punch resistance is a funny thing because it can actually fluctuate throughout the course of a fighter's career. Yeah, it can. Some people may not realize this. They may think that the chin you have when you start out on your pro debut is the same chin that you retire with however many years later, but it's actually not. Punch resistance can go up and down and there's a number of different factors that can affect it. If you are a fighter who fights at a weight division that has a a weight limit, then you may well drain yourself to get down to a particular weight. That can affect your punch resistance. If you've just come off a knockout loss, the psychological scars, and perhaps even there's some kind of uh, neurological side effects you're dealing with, that can affect your punch resistance. And I'll give you an example. Lucian Butte, who was never known for having a great chin, but when he was stopped by Carl Froch, after that, his punch resistance appeared to get even worse. He fought a guy called Denis Grachev in one of his comeback fights. And anytime Grachev even brushed him with anything remotely resembling a solid punch, Lucian Butte's legs were all over the place. He was almost shell-shocked from what had happened to him against Carl Froch. He just had not recovered psychologically and his punch resistance had deteriorated. However, after the Gradchev fight, Butte continued fighting and eventually, when he got in the ring with people like James DeGale and Badu Jack, his punch resistance appeared to have improved significantly since the Dennis Gradchev fight. He had recovered psychologically. He was in a better place and maybe there was some neurological healing that had gone on. Another example of how punch resistance can be dramatically affected by just one fight would be Jeff Lacey when he lost to Joe Calzaghe. Because prior to losing to Calzaghe, Lacey's chin was pretty solid. But after Calzaghe beat him and, you know, Calzaghe didn't stop him, but he gave him a horrendous beating. After Calzaghe beat him, Lacey's punch resistance was never the same again. Everybody seemed to be hurting Jeff Lacey. So again, either it was totally psychological or there was something neurological that happened to Jeff Lacey that messed his punch resistance up in the wake of that loss. Uh, And there have been many fighters over the years who have been accused of having a glass jaw, but have gone on to prove to have a fairly decent chin. I mean, Lennox Lewis might be a good example of that. Because when Lewis was knocked out by Oliver McCall, he instantly got the label as being chinny and having a glass. I mean, there are still people now who say Lennox Lewis had a glass jaw. But he went on to have fights like the Mercer fight, where he took all Mercer's best shots. He fought him toe to toe. Fight was in a phone booth and Mercer could punch. I'm not saying he was one of the greatest heavyweight punchers of all time, but he could punch. I mean, you saw what he did to... Poor Tommy Morrison, another guy, by the way, who was accused of having a glass jaw, but a shot which knocked Morrison out, Lennox Lewis was able to take him and never came close to going down against Ray Mercer. Lewis also had tough fights where he took a lot of shots 
against Vitaly Klitschko, against Shannon Briggs. You know, there were many, many fights out there against Holyfield where Lewis had to take shots on the chin and he took them no problem. But then, of course, he was knocked out with one punch again by Hasim Ratman and the questions about Lewis's chin come up. And as I've already mentioned, after the Ratman fight, in the last fight of his career, where he fought Tyson, then he fought uh, Vitaly Klitschko. And I remember watching the Klitschko fight and Lewis was just eating Klitschko's right hands up. And Ian Dark, who was commentating for Sky at the time, said, Lewis, you know, gets clipped by a, a Klitschko right hand. And Ian Dark said, Lewis walked right through it, surprisingly, <laughs> because of the fact that a couple of fights before, Lewis had been ironed out by Hasim Ratman, right? He got revenge in the rematch, fought Tyson, then fought Klitschko. So, yeah, even Lennox Lewis's chin, some fights he was able to take loads of shots without even looking like he was close to going down. And in those fights with Ratman and McCall, one shot is all it took and he was out. You know, against McCall, first time he did get up, but he was in a terrible state. Vladimir Klitschko, same thing. He was always accused of having a weak chin. But if you look at his losses, I mean, yeah, Corey Saunders knocked him out. Corey Saunders could really punch and he was very fast. Russ Purity stopped him. It was kind of more fatigued than anything. The Samuel Peter fight, I think that was an example of Vladimir Klitschko, again, being shell-shocked. I don't think he'd really recovered from uh, what had happened to him against Lamont Brewster and even against Corey Saunders. Because in that... Uh, Samuel Peter fight, the first one, any punch which even remotely grazed him had Klitschko's legs wobbling and he wanted to take, take a knee. So again, I think that it's the psychological effect of being knocked out in the past or being dropped in the past, which can linger on in a fighter's psyche and actually affect their punch resistance. You know, uh, other examples of fighters who were accused of having glass jaws. Uh, I mean, even Tyson Fury, to be honest. Dylan White came out and said Tyson Fury is chinny, that he had him down several times in sparring. But one thing we know about Tyson Fury is whenever he's been down from a punch, he's recovered extremely quickly. I mean, almost immediately. Tyson Fury's gone down heavy several times, but unlike Anthony Joshua, it don't take him three, four, five rounds to recover. When he went down against Nevin Pikic, he got up, he was right within a few seconds. When he went down against Steve Cunningham, he got up, he was right within a few seconds. When he went down against Deontay Wilder in the 12th round, he got up and he was right within a few seconds. So Tyson Fury's powers of recovery are tremendous. And therefore, some people, in their definition, would say Tyson Fury's got a good chin. Because yes, he goes down, but he recovers quickly, gets up and he can continue. So to some people, that's a good chin. To other people, they say, oh, no, he's, he's still chinny because he goes down, right? Um, I've seen some people say Dylan White is chinny. Dylan White's been down a few times, but much like Tyson Fury, other than in the Anthony Joshua fight where he was exhausted and he got knocked out by the uppercut, the other times Dylan White has been hurt or been down, he's recovered pretty quick. Uh, Deontay Wilder, of course, was down against Harold Sconias earlier in his career. This is the Sconius fight right here on Box Rec. If we just zoom in. So Wilder was down. Sconius down four times, Wilder down once. And they've got pictures here. Some of you guys, guys may have seen these pictures. That's Wilder on the floor uh, after getting cracked by a big Sconius right hand. There's a fight report here about Wilder getting dropped in that fight. And so once people found out about the Harold Sconius fight, there was accusations that Deontay Wilder had a glass jaw. There were people running around who did not believe Wilder could take a punch, partly because of the Sconia's fight, but also because of Wilder's build, because he's skinny. They also looked at the Eric Molina fight and said, oh, Wilder was hurt by Eric Molina. He was clearly hurt and this, that, and the other. They looked at that tiny little clip of Wilder sparring David Hay where his knees appeared to buckle and they were once again banging a drum saying that Wilder can't take a punch. But yet when Wilder fought Berman Stavern first time, 
He took Stavern's punches perfectly okay. And he's fought, you know, several people since then where he's taken the punches just fine. I mean, even in his last fight against Luis Ortiz, he got caught with shots, which fair enough, he did see the punches coming, but still he got caught with shots, which looked fairly solid to me. And he was able to take him no problem. So has Deontay Wilder's punch resistance improved over the years? Maybe it has. Maybe he's just become accustomed to taking the shots in sparring, taking the shots with the little gloves in the ring. And his punch resistance has actually improved over the years. One thing I can tell you is that you're not going to turn a guy who has a legit glass jaw into somebody who has an iron jaw. That's impossible. But I, I, as I say, punch resistance can fluctuate throughout a fighter's career depending on various factors. You know, whether a fighter's weight drained, whether a fighter's in the right place psychologically, etc. Sometimes it might not even be a case where the fighter has been knocked out or stopped in his last fight or one of his recent fights. Sometimes a, a guy just might not be ready and switched on mentally to take punishment. You know, you have to be in a, a particular mind frame. You have to gear yourself up mentally to go in there and be taking hard shots with them little 10 ounce gloves on, which are, you know, very hard. So sometimes a fighter might be distracted outside the ring or, or whatever the case may be, and they'll get in the ring and, and they just can't take a shot as well as normal. The mind's just not on the job. So that's what I'll say about punch resistance. But as far as Anthony Joshua goes, there's more than enough evidence so far in his career to suggest that this guy doesn't have a great chin at the very least. And that Andy Ruiz will be able to hurt him in the rematch. AJ, in some of his interviews and whatnot, says he's been sparring hard to get himself used to being hit hard in the fight. And that's something David Hay said that Anthony Joshua would need to do. But you don't want to leave yourself neurologically damaged <laughs> going into the ring. There were rumors of that first time around, right? With some people saying he had a concussion going into the fight. Uh, will it be the same this time around? Is, is he going to go into the fight with another concussion? This is one of the issues and one of the things people debate about hard sparring. That's why Tunde Ajayi says he's not particularly a fan of fighters having gym wars because you can get damaged before you go into the fight. But then again, you got David Hay on the other side of the argument saying, no, you get used to the punishment. You get used to getting beaten up in the gym and you have to get yourself battle hard and ring hard and you have to get yourself into that mind state and, to, and into that physical state when you're going into the ring so that when you get hit in the actual fight, it's not a shock to you. I guess people's bodies react in different ways, you know, and we'll see how Anthony Joshua's body reacts in this Ruiz rematch because he will get hit. And as I say, however you want to class Anthony Joshua's chin, because some people bring up the Klitschko fight and they say, well, he got up from the Klitschko shot, which was a tremendous punch, right? And also in the previous round, he took loads of Klitschko punches, left hooks and all that kind of stuff. He took them just fine. And they use that as evidence to say that he doesn't have a glass jaw. Um, well, as I say, we've seen enough evidence to know for certain that AJ's vulnerable in terms of his punch resistance. He's been hurt far too many times for you to sit back and say he's got a good chin. No, he doesn't have a good chin. No, no, not at least not by my definition. He don't have a good chin. Um, he hasn't got the weakest chin I've ever seen on a heavyweight. That would be somebody like Michael Mora or Herbie Hyde. They had real, real weak chins at heavyweight. But, and even Tommy Morrison had a real weak chin. But AJ's chin definitely ain't good. And Ruiz definitely has the power to hurt Anthony Joshua. We saw that first time around. And, it, and it's with Ruiz, see, some people are questioning Ruiz's power. Joseph Parker said that Andy Ruiz hit him harder than anybody else he's been in the ring with. That's what he said. And he was questioned about that. And the interviewer said, well, he, are you saying he hits harder than AJ? And he said, well, AJ never really caught me clean. So I don't know what AJ's power is really like. Even though I went 12 rounds, he never really caught me properly. But of the fighters who have caught me properly, Ruiz hit harder than any of them. And remember, Joseph Parker has been in the ring with Ruiz twice. 
He fought him in a professional fight for the vacant WBO heavyweight title. And he also sparred Ruiz years previous. So, yeah, he said that Ruiz hit him harder than anybody. And it's Ruiz's hand speed combined with what power he does have, which is going to hurt you. It's not just the brute force of his punches, because I don't think he has the brute force behind his shots that maybe AJ has or Wilder or, you know, some of the other guys out there. He probably doesn't have that elite brute force power, but he has enough power, clearly, and certainly enough to hurt AJ, certainly enough to knock AJ out uh, with that hand speed. As they say, the old adage is the punch you don't see is the one that's going to hurt you. And Andy Ruiz against AJ in the first fight was able to land plenty of shots that AJ just couldn't see. So it's going to be intriguing. It's going to be fascinating. It's going to be uh, really a, a, a litmus test, an acid test for Anthony Joshua's chin this fight. Because <laughs> at some point he's going to get cracked. That's just that's going to happen. The only way that wouldn't happen is if he somehow managed to knock Andy Ruiz out. But if this fight goes rounds, as I'm expecting it to, because Andy Ruiz has got a good chin. I mean, that's someone who we can say has got a good chin. Because I've seen that guy get cracked with loads of big shots. Not just in the AJ fight, but in other fights too. By big, big dudes hit this guy on the chin, and he's solid. So, the fight is almost certainly going to go rounds. If it ends early, you would imagine it's going to be Ruiz knocking AJ out. Uh, but if AJ manages to stay away and whatever, the fight's going to go rounds. Eventually, he's going to get hit. And how he reacts is going to be absolutely crucial. And it's going to tell us a lot about AJ. Has he recovered psychologically from what happened in the first fight? Has his punch resistance improved? Has it deteriorated? Or is it just the same? You know, funny enough, when you look at that first fight with Ruiz... In the third round, that's the most hurt he was in the fight, right? When he goes down first time from the left hook, he's seriously hurt. And the second time towards the end of the round, he's, he's still in a, in a daze. Ruiz puts some punches together and, you know, AJ is overwhelmed and he goes down. But the knockdowns that occur in, was it round seven the fight ended in? It was round seven, wasn't it? The, the two knockdowns that occur in that round are not as heavy. And AJ doesn't appear to be, to be as badly hurt in those rounds. I mean, he was still hurt, obviously, but he doesn't appear to be as badly hurt in those rounds, uh, in that round, as he was in uh, round three. So he did appear to recover to some extent, you know, perhaps not completely, but he was taking Ruiz's shots a bit better later in the fight. And that's another thing that can happen. During the course of a fight, you can start getting used to a guy's power. You can become numb to a guy's power uh, during the course of a fight. So, I mean, a good example might be Marquez against Pacquiao in their first fight. Marquez was shell-shocked in the first round. He was down multiple times. But as the fight progressed, he obviously adjusted to Pacquiao's style, started timing Pacquiao and counter-punching him. But he also got adjusted to Pacquiao's punching power and his speed. So he wasn't as shocked uh, when he got hit as he was in that first round. So you can, throughout the course of a fight, actually adjust to a guy's power to some extent. So, uh, I mean, obviously there's levels of power, right? If you're fighting uh, a guy like Andy Ruiz, he's got that hand speed and whatnot, but I don't think he's got as much brute force in his punches as AJ or certainly not Wild or somebody like that. So there's more chance of you adjusting to Ruiz's power maybe than adjusting to somebody like Deontay Wilder's power. Can anybody adjust to Deontay Wilder's power? Deontay Wilder, as I've said, is one of the hardest punches I've ever seen in my life. I've been saying this for a long time. Um, and, and I know what I'm looking at when it comes to a puncher. Years ago, when Deontay Wilder knocked out uh, what's the guy's name now? The Eastern European guy who virtually had a seizure on the canvas when Deontay Wilder hit him. Lykovic. And I remember debating with people at the time about Wilder's power because there was all these skeptics about Deontay Wilder's power. And I said, no, Wilder's power is for real. At that time, I wasn't saying that he's definitely going to go on to be, you know, a long reigning champion and 
the best in the division. No, I wasn't saying any of that, but I was saying his power is for real. I don't know about the rest of his game yet, but his punching power is absolutely world class. Because yeah, he was knocking out journeymen, but I've seen other top fighters fight many of those same journeymen and they weren't starching them the way Wilder was. So yeah, his power is incredible. But is there anybody out there who can take his power? Because some of the greatest punches of all time have eventually come up against somebody who they can't drop. <laughs> somebody who just takes their shots and takes their shots and they can't do nothing with them. I mean, we've seen Deontay, I guess, in the first Stavern fight. Well, he did drop Stavern. It wasn't called a knockdown. Um, he never dropped Johan Duopa. Duopa was able to take his shots. Uh, and maybe he'll come across somebody eventually who can just take his punches and keep coming at him. Maybe Jarrell Miller. We'll see. Anyway, maybe that's a subject for a different video. But for this video, punch resistance. Does AJ have a glass jaw? Uh, is it going to be an ongoing thing throughout his career? Will his punch resistance improve? Will it decline and deteriorate? Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Will he be able to take Andy... This is the most crucial thing. Will he be able to take Andy Ruiz's punches in this rematch? Because he will get hit. Anybody thinking AJ won't get hit, you're deluded. He's going to get hit. And, and I'm not just talking about by some speculative jabs or something. No, he's going to get hit with some power shots in this fight. Yeah. Will he be able to take them? Or will he find himself wobbled and on the canvas again? Drop your comments in the comment section below. Let me know how you feel. It's happening I'm out. Join me on Patreon. I upload a minimum of two podcasts every single week, covering a wide variety of controversial topics, as well as live stream Q&A sessions. Take a look on screen right now at some of the podcasts I've produced so far. For just $3 a month, the equivalent of about £2 a month, you get access to all my new podcasts and my entire back catalogue of past podcasts, including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen on your computer or on your smartphone or tablet by downloading the Patreon app from the Google Play Store or the App Store for free. The Patreon app also allows you to download each podcast in MP3. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to dozens of hours of exclusive content. It's easy to sign up, there's no contract, and you can cancel at any time. So come and join our community of free and critical thinkers by signing up with me here on Patreon today.